A physicist investigating the world has always been similar to Sherlock Holmes investigating a crime scene, looking for clues trying to solve the mystery, to find who is responsible for its physical phenomenon. For Isaac Newton, the mystery was planetary motion. Why does the moon revolve around the Earth? And gravity was found to be the guilty one, the cause behind the phenomenon. For James Clerk Maxwell, the mystery was light. Why does a lamp emit light? And electromagnetism was found to be the guilty one, the cause behind the phenomenon. For cosmologists, the crime scene is everything. The mystery is our very existence. Why does anything exist? What happened in the beginning? How did galaxies, the homes of stars and planets, come to be? How did the universe itself come to be? And one of the most amazing feats of modern physics is that these questions are not out of our grasp. For the first time in the history of humanity, we can tell a story about the history of the cosmos, based not on our imagination, but on data. We can tell a creation story based not on myth, but on science. Even though the questions are not answered yet, we can use the tools of science to map a way towards addressing them. Even though the cosmos is not yet fully understood, every indication is that it is understandable. Cosmology, the story of the universe, what we know about its history, what we don't know, and how we go about discovering what is yet unknown, is one of the most active fields of astrophysics, and in fact, all of physics today. So let's start by asking, what do we know about the universe? One of the most secure facts about the universe, something we are fairly certain about, is that the universe is expanding. Space between galaxies is swelling up, much like the Tao between raisins does in a baking muffin. The galaxies themselves aren't expanding. They are held together by the mutual gravitation attraction of the stars and other matter that comprises them. Neither a larger, close association of galaxies, called galaxy groups or galaxy clusters. Gravity holds these structures bonded together, preventing the space between them from expanding. But the space between distant galaxies, the space between galaxy clusters, is growing. As a result, all large structures in the universe are moving away from each other. But how do we know it is so? In order to understand how we found out about the expansion of the universe, we have to first ask ourselves, what would an expanding universe look like? Imagine a bunch of large structures, like galaxies very distant from each other, represented by the blue dots. Time goes forward, the universe expands. A second later, about 100 kilometers of space has been added between each pair of galaxies. If you look at this picture from the outside, it looks like a perfectly uniform process. There is no preferred point in the universe, everything moves away from everything else. But this is the entire universe we're talking about. There is no outside to observe this process from. So we have to position ourselves on one of these galaxies and try to think what effect this expansion will appear to have on our distant neighbors. Let's say our galaxy, our home, is this orange dot. After one second, galaxy A has moved 100 kilometers away from us. So it appears to us that galaxy A has a recession speed of 100 kilometers per second. But galaxy B, which was originally twice as far from us, has moved 200 kilometers away from us. So its recession speed appears to be 200 kilometers per second. So this is what an expanding universe looks like to an observer inside the universe. The farther away a galaxy is, the faster it appears to be moving away from us. This is exactly what Edwin Hubble discovered in 1929. He measured independently distances and recession speeds for 24 galaxies and found that they followed this general trend. 
The farther away a galaxy was, the faster it appeared to be moving away from us. Since then, we increased this sample by a lot. Distances and velocities have now been measured independently for hundreds of galaxies, and they were found to closely follow a linear relation, just like the one predicted in an expanding universe. This relation is now known as the Hubble law, and the recession of all galaxies from all other galaxies, the expansion of the universe, is known as the Hubble flow. So it looks like the universe is expanding. But are we sure? Or is there maybe some other way to explain the observations of Hubble? We can use the scientific method to check. If the universe is indeed expanding, the hypothesis should have predictable consequences, other than the Hubble flow. Let's try to imagine what such consequences could be. If the universe is expanding, this means that as time goes by it becomes bigger, less dense and colder. This means that in the past the universe must have been smaller, denser and hotter. And the further in the past we go, the smaller, the denser, the hotter the universe must have been. And if we keep turning the clock back in this way, at some point in its past, the universe must have been so dense, so hot, that all matter in it was ionized. Electrons were stripped away from nuclei, free charges zooming about everywhere. The entire universe must have been an ionized soup, a burning bowl of plasma. But wait, we do have intuition about how a burning bowl of plasma behaves. After all, we do have a burning ball of plasma nearby, our own sun. And what does this ball of hot plasma do? It emits radiation, roughly at wavelengths we can see with our eyes. What happens to this radiation, one might wonder? As long as the contents of the universe are ionized, the radiation is just bounced around, scattered in different directions. But the universe doesn't stay ionized for long. If we now run the clock forward again, the universe is once again expanding, getting bigger, less dense, and colder. Until, at some point, it becomes so cold that electrons no longer are energetic enough to evade the attraction of the protons. So electrons and protons combine, making neutral hydrogen a substance that allows the radiation to pass through it. So this radiation, the ashes from a time when the universe was super hot and super dense, is released and starts its never-ending journey through the universe. And as it travels, the radiation, like the universe, cools. Light is an electromagnetic wave, and like every wave, it has peaks and troughs. As the universe expands, the peaks and troughs also get farther away from each other, making the radiation initially more red, then infrared, and eventually, by the time the present time comes about, microwave in wavelength. If our hypothesis of an expanding universe is correct, this microwave light should still be reaching us from the dawn of time. Indeed, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson discovered this isotropic microwave emission in the 1960s and earned a Nobel Prize for it. The signal has a spectrum, a distribution of wavelengths, characteristics of a black body, a dense, hot, opaque medium just like the universe was during its infancy. It arrives on Earth from every direction, just like we would expect from a cosmic signal. This emission is now known as the Cosmic Microwave Background and its detection is a glorious confirmation of the expanding universe. The fact that the universe is expanding did not come as a shock when Hubble first discovered his law. Einstein's general theory of relativity strongly suggested that a static universe is not stable. The natural state of space on such unfathomably large scales is either to be expanding or contracting. Einstein's general relativity also predicts a relation between the expansion rate of the universe, the contents of the universe, matter and energy, and the curvature of space. 
But what do we mean when we are talking about the curvature of space? We mean how to properly do geometry, how to calculate distances, how trigonometry works, whether the Pythagorean theorem holds. If the Pythagorean theorem holds, we say that space is flat. This is the easiest case for cosmologists to study. Geometry is easiest then, but it doesn't have to be true. The geometry of the universe could very well resemble more than of lines on a sphere or lines on a saddle. How do we find out which one actually applies to our universe? The cosmic microwave background, of course. At first look, this emission appears perfectly isotropic. But if we increase the contrast by 10,000 times, we start seeing noise. Parts of the sky where the light is a little bit hotter and parts of the sky where the light is a little bit colder. This Hot spots and cold spots were first detected by NASA's COBE satellite, and they have been studied intensely, with most prominent advances, those by the space missions WMAP and, most recently, Planck. This picture, a snapshot of our baby universe, is one of the most important observations in cosmology. First, it gives us clues about where all the structure in the universe, the galaxies and the galaxy groups and the galaxy clusters come from. It marks the regions that were originally just a little bit more dense than their surroundings. These regions, with the help of gravity, start attracting more and more matter towards them, gradually building up to the largest structures we see in the universe today. Second, it gives us clues about the geometry in space. Measuring the geometry of space is in its essence a trigonometry experiment. If you have a stick of known size at some known distance and you also measure how big it looks on the sky, then you can try out the trigonometric relations that apply in different geometries connecting these three quantities and see which one works. So how does the cosmic microwave background help us with that? The picture of our baby universe is full of freckles, hot spots and cold spots of all sizes. But not all of these spots are equally likely. There is, in fact, a most likely size of a hot spot. We expect that there should be one. The reason is that it takes time for adjacent parts of a hot spot or cold spot to coordinate to have a matching temperature. Information doesn't move around infinitely fast. In fact, inside the plasma, as the young universe was, information moves around at the speed of sound. But at the time the cosmic microwave background was emitted, the universe was very young, just 400,000 years old. There just hadn't been that much time available for very big hotspots to form. Some might be there due to sheer luck, but the biggest hotspot that can be frequently encountered must have been just the distance a sound wave could have covered within the 400,000 years the universe had been around for back then. So here is a stick of known size, the speed of sound times 400,000 years. This stick is also at a known distance, the distance light traveled between now and when the cosmic microwave background was emitted. So all we are now missing to conduct our trigonometry trials is to find how frequently this hotspot appears on the sky. Physicists have a neat way to analyze noisy maps to find the size of frequent features. It's called the power spectrum. If we generate the power spectrum of this map, we obtain this beautiful curve. The higher the curve, the more frequent a hotspot of a particular size. And the size of the hotspot we can just read off the horizontal axis. So it is easy to see that the most frequent hotspot appears to cover just one degree on the sky. With all our ingredients at hand, we perform our trigonometry experiment. And we find that the only geometry where size, distance and apparent angle of the most frequent hotspot match is in fact the simplest one. The universe is flat. The Pythagorean theorem holds. So far we have learned 
that the universe is expanding at a rate close to 70 kilometers per second for every megaparsec of distance between us and the receding galaxy, and that the universe has a flat geometry. But these two things alone, according to Einstein, reveal even more. General relativity tells us that there is a very particular amount of matter and energy we need to have in the universe if we want its geometry to be flat. This is then another hypothesis that we have to go out and test. What are the contents of the universe? Matter like the one we see all around us, for once. Planets and stars and gas. Everything that makes galaxies shine at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we go out and count. How many galaxies? How many stars does it have? How much gas? How many planets is each star likely to have? Adding them all up, we end up with a sad sum. All the stuff we're familiar with, the stuff we, and the Earth, and the Sun, and flowers, and jewelry, and elephants are made of, they're just about 5% of the amount of matter and energy that we need to make the universe flat. The discrepancy is shocking. Even if our measurements are not perfect, we can have been so far off in our estimate of the geometry or in our estimate of the amount of normal matter that exists in the universe. What can be possibly going on? Thankfully, matter can also be detected in ways other than by the amount of light it emits. We can also detect it because it exerts gravity on its surroundings. A galaxy cluster will attract galaxies around it and we will see those galaxies orbiting the cluster. We repeat this measurement, this time using our gravitational eyes. And the discovery is equally shocking. Galaxy clusters contain five times more matter that does not emit any light than matter that does. We call this dark matter, exactly because it doesn't shine at all, and we currently don't know its nature. The orbit of galaxies in galaxy clusters are not our only evidence of dark matter. We see dark matter in the orbits of gas around galaxies and through the attraction it exerts on light, a phenomenon Einstein predicted called gravitational lensing. And the result is always the same, five times more dark matter than regular matter. The nature of dark matter remains to this day one of the greatest mysteries of modern cosmology, an area of intense investigation and great scientific interest. But if we do the math, 5% of visible matter and 25% of dark matter, still this only brings us to 30% of the amount of matter or energy we need to make the universe flat. What happens with the rest? In the 1990s, another shocking discovery came to give an answer to this question and tie together our current model of the cosmos. Astronomers continue to observe receding galaxies at higher and higher distances, now billions of light years away. But thanks to the finite speed of light, the farther out we look, the further in the past we look. So these observations of the expansion of the universe that are billions of light years away also record the expansion of the universe as it was happening billions of years ago. Scientists expected to see the expansion of the universe slowing down as time went by, which would make sense. The universe started expanding very early on for some yet unknown reason, and the gravitational attraction of the matter in it must have been slowing down ever since. And yet, scientists conducting these observations made an astonishing discovery. The expansion of the universe was not slowing down at all. In fact, it was accelerating. How could this be? All matter, shining and dark, would only slow the expansion. In order to get acceleration, we should have something new, something unthinkable, something that was not matter at all. We should have some form of energy that acted anti-gravitationally, pushing everything away from each other. This is yet another form of not understood constituent of the universe. We call it dark energy. We may not know what it is, but we do know how much of it we must have 
in order to make the universe accelerate as much as it appears to be doing. And amazingly enough, the amount that we need is also exactly equal to the amount of energy that has been missing to make the universe flat. So with just the right amount of dark energy, we can both make the universe accelerate as much it appears to be doing, and make the universe flat as it appears to be. So where does this leave us? We do understand more about the universe than humanity ever has in its history. The universe is expanding. The universe is flat. And all matter and energy that we are familiar with amounts only for a tiny percentage of the contents of the universe. What the rest is, we do not know. The nature of dark matter is unknown to us. We do not understand the nature of dark energy. We do not know why the universe started to expand early on. We have more questions than ever. But we are also optimistic that these questions are not outside our reach. The scientific method, formulating hypotheses, designing observations, and using them to test our hypotheses with new data, provides a path towards new knowledge for cosmology and for fundamental physics. The future is bright. Our universe keeps expanding, and so is our knowledge about its history. <laughs>